This looks like the psychology of a predator uh, similar to a serial killer. And Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. On Christmas Day, the media repeated former FBI agent Jennifer Coffin-Daffer's belief that the Idaho killer could be an incel. This is a quote from the Daily Mail. Former FBI agent Jennifer Coffin-Daffer claims that investigators will be looking at everyone associated with each victim, but believes that it could be a very outlying individual because of the lack of an arrest, end quote. Two days prior to that, a criminologist, Dr. Casey Jordan, said that uh, she thought the quadruple murderer might be a serial killer and a psychopath. On December 23rd, Brian Enton asked Dr. Jordan whether she believes the killer might be a professional. Yeah, I heard you ask the chief that question, and he kind of sidestepped it. And I have to say, I, from the outset, uh, kind of went out on a limb and said, this looks like the psychology of a predator uh, similar to a serial killer. And that is not to say I think this person has done it before, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if this person does it again. Now, if you've been following this case, you can find an, almost any expert with a different theory that will eventually match your own. Let's be clear, an incel and a serial killer predator are very different animals. So Coffin Duffer believes that the killer could have built up anger against one or more of the slain students, but added that her main theory, according to the Daily Mail, is that the killer is someone with perverted thoughts and anger toward women, end quote. That sounds like Coffin Duffer is suggesting the killer had a sort of generalized anger against women, doesn't it? Well, if that's the case, why weren't two survivors, both women, also killed? I mean, if it took almost eight hours simply to figure out that a crime had happened, the woman-hating killer had more than enough time to complete his, his mission with two more women in the house as well. So why didn't he? Well, not because it was a generalized hatred, but because it wasn't. That's my opinion. In my opinion, it was personal and it was targeted. One third of the potential targets in that house, as well as a dog, were allowed to live. Now, in terms of Dr. Jordan's assessment, calling it the psychology of a predator, similar to a serial killer, I have a hard time imagining that this is the first time this person has ever plunged a knife into someone. I have a hard time imagining just the first time on November 13th, and he managed to execute all four of these first times in a sort of precision effective um, uh, event, execution. And I don't think you have to leap into the psychology of a serial killer for a pretext. It could far more easily be someone uh, who is a hunter, who's, who's had experience in terms of that, in terms of hunting. It could, could also be to some extent violent computer games. There may even be a medical person in that person's family. He could even be someone who has fished a great deal. What I find laughable is this idea that a professional killer wouldn't use a gun with a silencer and if it was someone, some sort of deviant predator, then we would see signs of that. We would see SA and all the rest. We don't. Now, unlike a former FBI agent or doctor of criminology, I don't have a sexy crime fighting title in front of my name. In fact, I think many of you guys will agree the most authentic voice in true crime either isn't that or it's kind of naff. It's kind of ridiculous. What do you really know about true crime? I mean, what's your expertise? Well, writing more than 100 books all on crime does imbue one with a deep sense of pattern recognition when it comes to crimes, when it comes to criminal psychology, patterns in criminal psychology. So my impression with these experts, as it is with most that flitter flutter into the true crime either, you know, when you have a high profile case like this, is that in spite of their deep knowledge and professional reputations, the understanding of a brand new case and a brand new killer feels invariably superficial. It feels a little bit, a little bit shallow. In fact, some of the default diagnosis you will hear from so-called experts in almost every major case is that the killer is either a narcissist, a psychopath, a pedophile, or a serial killer. When you hear assessments like that, you should run, or at the very least, change channels. 
My area of expertise is narrow as well as broad, and I think that is necessary to see the woods for what they are and the trees for what they are, and then to see ex exactly how the trees make up particular woods. In other words, I think you need um, a specialized speciality, and then you also need a sort of a wide area of general knowledge that is nevertheless quite extensive. That is if you want to apply the whole idea of thin slicing, you come to a crime, as we do now, not knowing all the information, but you're able to slice your way to the heart of what is really going on, to see those core patterns. So what I've done, I studied the law. That's useful. But an even narrower expertise is needed, such as statistical analysis. That applies more commonly to things like economics, which is another field I've studied, and media analysis, which is a field I've actually worked in. But statistical analysis can provide far more scientific insight in a, in a sort of a specific and targeted manner than a sort of shallow analysis from a blowhard on television showing what they believe about a criminal or crime. So what do the stats tell us about serial killers? Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you have, welcome to True Crime Rocket Science. Yeah, we try to be more intelligent and more insightful and more anchored to the evidence than many other channels. We try to be curious and we try not to speculate recklessly. We also have a Patreon community on patreon.com slash TCRS. So if you're looking for more intelligent analysis, more reasonable folk, well, then this is the channel for you. If you're enjoying this episode, please like, share, leave a comment and let's get started. So in terms of statistics, do you believe the motive in this case is rage? Simple question. Yes or no? So th that word <laughs> has become so ubiquitous. We've actually seen it in some of the headlines, such as this one. Idaho murders, rage, randomness, among similarities to Ted Bundy's infamous killings, former attorney says. I don't know, that is one of the most ridiculous headlines I think I've seen. Then there's this one as well. It has to be somebody that's pretty angry in order to stab four people to death. That's actually a quote from the coroner that was made into a headline. But what you see there are emotions, rage and anger that, are, that have become part of the media narrative. That's important. Statistically, though, enjoyment and or financial gain or both are far more likely motives than anger when it comes to serial killers. In fact, cumulatively, 80% of serial killings involve thrills or lust and then also financial gain. So if you add those together, that makes up 80% of the motives of serial killers. And then less than 10% involve anger. Put otherwise, serial killers are four times more likely to kill for financial reasons. And in the Idaho case, we know that wasn't the case because nothing was stolen. We know nothing was stolen because that is what the chief, um, I think his name is Fry, that is what he told us. They are also about six times more likely to kill for lust or for fun. If the killer killed for fun here, why did he stop after four when he succeeded in executing the crimes without alerting anyone? Those are stats just according to motive. If we look at the stats far more generally in terms of overall homicides, how common are serial killings? Do you know the answer? Well, if you want to be a true crime rocket scientist, you should know simple things like this. How common are serial killings generally? Are they very common? Are they somewhat common? Or are they not common at all? What do you think is the answer? According to the Scientific American, quote, serial killings account for no more than 1% of all murders committed in the U.S., Based on recent FBI crime statistics, there are approximately 15,000 murders annually. That's in America. So that means that there are no more than 150 victims of serial murder in the U.S. in any given year. Now, statistically speaking, the Idaho murders have a low probability, around 1 in 100, of being a serial killer. So when you have a situation like that, about a 1% chance of it being something. Do you really think you should go onto national TV and say, I think this could be the work of a serial killer. I think that is likely. I think it's the opposite. I think you could say there's a 99% chance that it's not a serial killer. 
That being said, according to the Scientific American quote, the FBI estimates that there are between 25 and 50 serial killers operating throughout the U.S. at any given time, end quote. In other words, right now, there could be as many as 50 serial killers in America. That may sound like a lot. You might say, oh God, there are 50 serial killers in America. Yes, 50 out of 350 million people. That works out to one serial killer for every 7 million Americans. Not 70, not 700, not 7,000 or 70,000 or 700,000 Americans, one in 7 million. So the entire population of Idaho is less than 2 million. It's about 1.9 million. So in terms of that, there should be, what is it, 0.3% chance of there being a serial killer there. It's also not necessarily the case that a serial killer that is out there is not in a dormant phase. But even if we accept that number, the statistical chance that any crime is the work of a serial killer is quite low. If you accept that there are 50 and they're all operating kind of at full capacity, they are all got the on switch on, then each one is responsible for an average of three murders per year. Three murders in America per year. It's not a lot. Going back to the article, quote, serial killers are always present in society. However, the statistics reveal that serial homicide is quite rare and it represents a small portion of all murders committed in the U.S. So if that's the case and that's a fact, why do you think serial killers and serial murderers come up in a case like this in the media narrative and the social media narrative? Do you think it's because the people talking about this know a lot about crime or perhaps don't know that much about crime? Why are you talking about something that's relatively rare as though it's something that is the a possibly obvious um, answer. Anyway, that is the bottom line here. And so when an expert says, almost as an off the top of my head, this is who I think this is, don't they know that serial homicide is rare and unlikely? Don't you know that? If you do know that, perhaps you should say that. Leave it in a comment. You sort of have to wonder whether they don't know this or do they know it, but it plays well on mainstream media. It's popular. It's what people want to hear. They want to be shocked. They want to hear that this crime is worse than it, that it actually is because it's, it feels like it's that way. And so it needs to be shocking um, to make an already high-profile case even more compelling. As soon as you do that, you are practicing not only for yourself, but you're teaching your audience to exaggerate things in order to be interesting and what that teaches is a um, going off the track of reality. And that, then good luck trying to solve a case. If you're always going to exaggerate, if you're always going to try and maximize or try to be popular, then you're not going to be very good at dealing with reality. And that's what true crime is all about. What really happened here? Not how can you make what really happened here sound really interesting? So if I'm being perfectly frank, I find the serial killer assessment laughable and ignorant. The first thing you think of when there's a crime like this isn't or shouldn't be serial killer. During the Kylie Rodney case, the first thing people thought was pedophile abductor. And you actually get that coming up very, very often when a young woman disappears. And uh, that is statistically very rare. And ultimately, that assessment didn't even almost turn out to be the case in the Kylie Rodney case. I do think the incel scenario is better, wrong, but less completely out of the ballpark than a serial killer. I've written a book on incels, I profiled them, and did a heck of a lot of research on Elliot Roger, Adam Lanza, and Nicholas Cruz, among others. What all of these incels have in common is something that keys into the forest fabric of this case. First, they were all students. Second, they are in what I regard as the sweet spot in terms of the likely age of the killer. Elliot Roger was 22 years old. Adam Lanza was 20 years old. And Nicholas Cruz, 19 years old, when they committed their crimes. The victims in this case are all either 21 years old or 20, 20 years old. 
Incidentally, if you come back to the stats, serial killers are statistically more likely to be older men, closer to 30 years old. In true crime, you soon find there are experts, just as there are channels, no doubt, that resonate with you and then some that don't. Now, although she often raises interesting points, I find I quite often don't quite agree with Coffendaffer. I will sort of feel, yeah, th that's true, but then she'll say something more and I'll be like, hmm, that part, not so much. So while I agree that there's an incel aspect to this case, I don't think we're dealing with a classic incel scenario. Incels are often so dysfunctional, so antisocial, that they appear invisible to the surrounding social fabric. I mean, what is going on with them is that they seem to lack agency entirely. And so you just don't see them, right? And so because of that, they actually have no personal connections. And so when incels do lash out, it tends to be arbitrary. And I don't think that is the case in this case. I don't think this is arbitrary lashing out. I am more comfortable looking at insults with regard to figuring out the fabric of this case because some of that psychology is relevant here and I do think this crime was committed by someone who was perhaps more volun uh, involuntarily celibate than he wanted to be. By the way, if you're finding that the audio that you're hearing and the pictures that you're seeing aren't synced all that well, it's because I don't want to spend my whole day doing that. Um, it is the festive period, and I don't want to spend too much time uh, syncing videos, which can take hours and hours, especially for long videos. So if you're finding the audio doesn't seem to really match the um, what you're seeing, well, it's because I need to wrap this up so that I can go out and celebrate with friends and family. Does that make sense? Now, Grey Hughes Investigates polled his audience yesterday on whether they thought the killer was an incel, and most said they didn't. Most of his audience, I think 56% said they didn't think it was an incel, but it was still quite close, almost 50-50. That poll from Grey Hughes Investigates, I think, represents something here, and that is that there is a certain amount of truth in the incel theory. In other words, that some of that psychology is relevant and resonates and is important to pay attention to. So according to the Daily Mail quote, and I think this is quoting from what Coffendaffer either said to them or to Newsweek, but she said, involuntary celibates or insults are part of a misogynistic subculture on shady online forums where users exchange fantasies about certain sexual things, including mass murder. Speaking to Newsweek, Coffendaffer said they're known as incels. And then she talked about who has watched this house, who is seeing all of these beautiful girls go in and out and their rage and their own personal horrific desires they realized that night. And then she seems to speculate that it's somebody still in that area, somebody that has seen these beautiful girls because only girls live there, right? End quote. Actually, no, a boy was staying there, and it wasn't as if they held a party there that night. It wasn't a, that party, a party that night got the supposed incel all riled up. I do think someone was aware of the house, though, which is why it feels more personal. One does wonder, was the killer surprised to encounter a male in the house? If he was surprised, well, doesn't that mean he wasn't watching the house like a hawk, but was somehow aware of it in a more incidental, peripheral fashion. Also, if they were in the area, probably they lived in the area or had some business in the area, which means possibly means they were more likely younger than older. So what exactly are incels so upset about? According to Coffendaffer, quote, an individual with absolutely horrible murderous desires against his woman, and it, it came to a boiling point combined with an opportunity, end quote. I don't really like the definition. I don't really get a sense now I know what, 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 what they are so upset about. So let's go to a real incel who recorded his feelings and get the inside track on what he says he's so upset about. And this is from Elliot Roger while he was still alive. I'll put a link to this video that I'm going to play 
the audio at least from it in the uh, in the description. So more specifically, where do these antisocial feelings arise from? Let's listen in. I am so angry right now. I was enjoying a peaceful time at this beach park. And what comes to sit in front of me? A young couple, a guy with his hot girlfriend. I mean, who do they think they are? Coming here, sitting in front of me to make me feel jealous? This is the reason why I hate the world. This is getting too out of hand. I can't go anywhere anymore without seeing these young couples getting jealous and you know, having them remind me of what I'm lacking in life. So there you have it, not just anger, but anger in the context of going without, of lacking something. Someone getting something uh, supposedly at their expense. Right now I'm wearing my Hugo Boss shirt. It's one of my favorite button-down shirts. This is a shirt I wore to the premiere of The Hunger Games. fabulous and yeah I did walk on the red carpet on that premiere it's quite quite an experience indeed so again being emasculated isn't the end of the world but being emasculated when you're entitled that makes it so much worse imagine how humiliating it must feel to understand oneself to be special to come from a particular privileged set of circumstances only for society, your peers, to decide, well, not only are you not as good as they are, you're actually not good enough for them. So there's a sense that you think you're superior and they think actually you are inferior. Quite a, quite a shock, quite an insight, isn't it? And then what is the result of that, which is maybe not so funny? What is the result of being basically cast out? It's quite simple. This world does not make sense. What do you think he's talking about when he says the world doesn't make sense? Well, it actually means that he can't make sense of it. It actually it does make sense, but he can't make sense of it. And also the world can't make sense of him. So what is that all about? Well, there's no sense of belonging. And if you think belonging is a silly idea... Uh, as long as I've been a creator, a blogger, a writer and so on, I'm sure many other creators have found this as well. There sometimes comes a time when someone who is a member or something uh, falls out of favor. Either they decide that they don't like you anymore or they are just behaving in an inappropriate manner. And there's a lot of enmity that arises out of that sense of, well, you no longer belong to this community either they don't want to or it's not really working out that's in a kind of an adult online situation you can see that there can be a lot of terrible feelings when you simply don't belong and as i said before social death my social death to you can be absolutely nothing it doesn't even register on your radar it means absolutely nothing to you but your social death to you means absolutely everything and it's in this context that one's got to really uh, recognize what is going on. Put yourself in that other person's shoes. How is somebody else experiencing a traumatic, terrible social death? And that's very hard for us to do. It's actually very hard to pay attention to perhaps how someone else might be feeling. How someone else may not feel they belong in, uh, in a community they want to belong to. Now, I don't think the Idaho killer had a sense of revulsion for people in relationships, not in a general sense. I think there was simultaneously a sense of revulsion that someone in particular wasn't with him and was with someone else. And that that specific feeling, though targeted at one person, also had accessories to those feelings. Who was sort of, she was having this fairy tale, but who was having fairy tales with that person? Kaylee, Maddie, and Zanna were all friends, and by extension, Ethan as well. So you were either part of that circle or you weren't. The killer didn't feel the survivors were part of that circle. That's the sense I get. Perhaps because they had only been living in the house for one or two months. 
What the experts don't acknowledge about Elliot Roger is that his despair was so deep, he was actually suicidal. And I don't think we have that case here. I also don't think we've got a, someone who's so deviant that he commits some sort of sexual offense, right? We've got actually got, in a weird way, a decent criminal in the sense that he doesn't cross certain lines. I certainly don't want to say that the crime that he committed, there was anything proper about it. I'm just saying, um, in terms of the comparisons that we're making, the despair clearly wasn't um, that extreme that he either wanted to commit suicide or kill the other two victims, or extreme in the sense that there was an additional aspect to the crime. Does that make sense? So there is a sense of kind of discipline from our killer, which is in a way... Um, gives us a sense of contradiction about him. So that isn't a great match to our killer, the insult or the serial killer aspect. Whereas Elliot Roger wanted to send a message and he even wrote a manifesto, I don't get a sense of that from the killer here in Idaho, who, if anything, closed the bedroom doors and muffled the screams of some of the victims. I mean, I think the only thing message he wanted to send was directly to his victims. It was that personal. So it looks like a similar, um, a, a sort of broadly similar scenario to Elliot Roger, sexual frustration within a gratuitous framework that doesn't seem to make sense, and then also humiliation because of his own particular narcissism. In a word, though, the motive is jealousy. Jealousy leading, leading to feelings of inadequacy and anger and eventually rage. There's also emasculation, but not ordinary emasculation, emasculation within the context of some guys cracking the nod as men in, in terms of the woman, sort of as chads, while others are kicked to the curb as not deserving, not measuring up, not valid. You're going to need to become a person on your own time. Uh, what you've learned at, at college is that you are... Uh, not a man, you're not good enough, and so you're going to have to spend some more time on yourself. Uh, you're going to need to somehow make yourself a bit more attractive, more uh, acceptable. So uh, good luck with that. Off you go. Right? So it's not just emasculation. It's emasculation within the context of some people um, cracking the nod, being accepted, people saying, you are really masculine, I really accept and like you, I'm in awe of you, and in that context, wow, you are actually shockingly not good enough. And, and also, I realize I don't deserve you. I deserve better. And you actually hear Elliot Roger saying something that I think a lot of guys have actually felt. They see girls with guys, and you sort of wonder, what on earth are you doing with that guy? He doesn't seem very bright, um, et cetera, et cetera. But obviously, in some way, the girls see agency there that the complainer doesn't actually have. And this is also why a serial killer doesn't fit the profile. This is about a young man trying and failing to become a man within the student setting, within the fabric of college. Right? It's not about an older person that's got some sort of long-standing gripe with society. Is that all? Well, because we are dealing with Idaho, which is the third most Mormon church members of any U.S. state, again, we are dealing with stats here, and the second highest percentage of members, Mormon members, that's after Utah, it's also possible that this crime was committed, how can one say, in the name of or under the banner of heaven. If you're not sure what that's all about, go and watch Under the Banner of Heaven on Netflix. You'll get a sense of why certain crimes, vicious crimes as well, might be committed. But given how long parties were going on at the fun hours, I find that a stretch. The critical question all of this conjecture is really swilling around is just this. How intimate is the relationship between the killer and the victims? Now, according to the Daily Mail, femicide can be split into two categories, intimate and not intimate with the former relating to the killing of women by current or former partners, end quote. I believe the 
experts are erring on the side of the killer not being intimate, almost a random stranger. In other words, it's not personal, it's a general feeling. But statistically, that's less likely. If there is a link to an intimate partner, then Ali should know who he is, so why don't they? And that's in a way part of uh, these experts' argument. If it was someone who was intimate, well then law enforcement should know who he is already. So the, the fact that they don't means that it's not um, someone intimate. In other words, because they don't know, it must be a non-intimate person. I, sh I should think you, sh you put a question mark at the end of that statement. Well, not necessarily. I think it's possible the surviving roommates may not have told Ali everything about who came into that house and what happened there. Just as in the Meredith Kircher case, I don't think the truth was told about the sexual activity in that house either. Increasingly, we have seen just how unreliable the students have been, even when dealing with mildly intrusive police activity. And I think it's within this knowledge gap that the killer may actually have a cushion, where he's actually got some room to move, where there's some doubt and uncertainty. I think there's another simple and obvious reason why this isn't a classical incel situation. As I said before, there were two female survivors. Although it's possible someone did scream and the scream caused the perpetrator to duck and run, in such haste he left the front door open, I do think if it was an arbitrary insult scenario, the order of the slayings would have been the reverse, starting at the bottom, starting right outside, so, so coming in the front door, going to the first bedroom he encountered, and then working his way up, not the other way around. This killer was a strategist, a hunter, someone who could compose himself in, stress, in a stressful situation. He was physically fit. I think that tells us a lot more about who we are dealing with than we realize. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time.